when a lot of people say, well, I only have five acres or 10 acres or whatever, it's like, don't ever limit yourself to what you actually are sitting on because there's probably plenty of grazing opportunities anywhere around the neighborhood. Like I said, with the infrastructure that I have, the fence, the water tubs, the dogs, and the sheep, that's all very easy to move anywhere. Minnesota Shepherd Janet McNally has learned from facing challenges. In fact, dealing with a wolf pack bent on her flock as a food source was one of the factors that led her to regenerative grazing. In this episode of Voices from the Field, NCAT Regenerative Grazing Specialist Linda Poole talks to Janet about her successes and challenges, ranging from those wolves to parasites and droughts to Minnesota's infamous winters as part of the She's Raising Sheep series. Let's listen. Hi, and welcome to another episode of ATRA's ongoing series called She's Raising Sheep. I'm Linda Poole, and I'm here today with our guest, Janet McNally. She's a successful shepherd, a prolific writer, a skilled teacher, and for over 40 years, the owner of Tamarack Lamb and Wool in Hinkley, Minnesota. Janet, thanks so much for taking time to talk with me today. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, well, I am really excited to hear the details of your story, but, you know, I always wonder right at the beginning, why sheep? Why did you decide to raise sheep? (laughs) Well, I knew I wanted to work outdoors. Uh, Last thing I ever wanted to do was an office job. So I was looking at various areas that I could work in. I mean, I even considered wildlife biology, but it seemed like There were very few jobs in that area. Dairy cattle were very expensive to get into, and you pretty much had to inherit a farm to do that. And sheep were small, very easy to get into, required very little infrastructure, just easy to get into is what I would say. Um, And that's kind of how I got started with sheep. Yeah, well, my story is similar, and I think there will be a lot of our listeners who raise sheep that might have started that way. Janet, there's so much that you've done in your journey with sheep, and a lot of us have have learned from your YouTube videos and from, uh, I understand now you have a new TikTok channel that I'd like to hear about, and through your articles in Gray's Magazine. And I just think about what I've learned with you really focuses on what, what I call the three Ps, the big challenges in shepherding, which are profit predators, and parasites. And we all face these challenges, but your story has been really amazing in how solving for one of these helped you solve for all of them. So what can you tell us about meeting the challenges of profit, predators, and parasites? All right. Well, when I graduated from Iowa State University, I was thinking high-rise sheep, (laughs) you know, just totally corn-fed, Uh, confined on very little land. Uh, It's just the model that we learned there, really. It's sort of the pipestone model. And I'm I'm not going to bash that model. It's appropriate for certain types of farms. However, uh, I wound up taking a job up in East Central Minnesota, which is pretty much very marginal land as far as growing any kind of crops up here. It's beef country. And so I had to learn through my students, really, that pasture was a viable option here, and we just didn't have the buildings that they had in the southwest part of the state. You know, the Pipestone model was, it began with a lot of uh, shepherds having uh, these cattle feeding sheds, and they would go back and forth between sheep and cattle, depending upon what the markets were like. And we just didn't have that here. We, we had dairy farms at that time, but they were mostly outdated, very small barns. And I quickly realized that everybody was constrained by the size of their barn as far as the size of their flock. And they might have much larger forage resource, resources on their farm, but they could only keep as many sheep as they could fit in the barn. And between just noticing that and also a little stint with 42 cent lambs, I was, you know, at that time, not making money on that kind of corn-based model. And I was looking for how can I cut the cost out of my sheep production? 
And I actually took the price of a lamb, the, the price that I got for a lamb, and I divvied it up as to who got what out of that lamb, like the lumber yard, the feed mill, hmm. uh, the veterinarian, the vet supply. And I was getting nothing. Hmm. So I decided to try to cut some of those costs out of there. And that's what got me into a pasture-based system because in this marginal area, we have a lot of land that we can lease relatively cheap. And when I say cheap, I mean, for most of the years that I've been raising sheep, we could rent ground for three to five cents per day per you. And uh, anyway, that's how I wound up getting onto pasture. And then that kind of leads us into the um, next one, which is the predators. I mean, I, I started out with what I call 90s style grazing management. And that's uh, very popular in the Midwest at the time, especially among dairy farms, all the pasture walks I went on to was kind of a four to six paddock model where you raised a paddock for about a week and then you'd move them to a new paddock, graze that for a week and move them to another paddock. So in anywhere from three to, to four weeks time, you would wind up where you started. And that kept the grass really vegetative. Mm -hmm. It was good nutrition for the sheep, but the downfall was it was putting the sheep back onto the pasture when the parasite larvae load was the highest. So we were struggling with having to deworm a lot during the summer. And as I got older and my shoulders a little weary from handling sheep, um, I was really looking for a way to not have to drench these sheep but at the same time, we wound up uh, in 1999, we wound up with a devastating situation with wolves. And to give you a little background, back in the early 90s, we experienced our first wolf. And by 99, what happened that year was we had a pack of 23 wolves come and visit. Wow. That, if that sounds astounding to you, you can look it up in the book called The Wolves of Minnesota. I think it's page 5051. It talks about pack size. And they that was the largest pack ever documented in Minnesota. It was documented 10 miles from our farm. And um, the kind of bizarre thing was is that we, we wound up losing 75 lambs. Uh, I know 40 of them disappeared in 10 days time not too sure when the others disappeared, but we were in that 90 style grazing model, which it was during lambing and we had the sheep spread out all over because we were doing this kind of drift lambing where we'd leave the sheep alone for 30 days mm -hmm. before we gather them up and start the rotational grazing. So we actually had sheep spread out for about two miles. And that's why we were hit so hard by those wolves is because basically they would distract the dogs down to one end of a field. We were in rather large paddocks at that time. And the wolves would go and just take lambs out of the other end of the field. And so the, the dogs you're talking about is you did have some livestock guardian dogs at that time, Janet? We did. We had four. Mm -hmm. And we had one llama. And the dogs, uh, depending upon the dog in the field, lost some lost nothing. And uh, the worst was a dog that lost 12 and a half percent of its lambs. Mm. Llama lost 50% of its lambs. So I always have to chuckle when people suggest llamas as predator control because that llama quickly figured out he was not for dinner. And he <laughs> would just sort of step aside and let the wolves eat the lambs. Whereas the dogs all gave it a good try. Now, some dogs did leave their sheep and join another dog and that's where I started and I could tell these dogs were afraid I mean some of these dogs didn't even have a voice the next day because they had barked so hard mm. I realized these dogs needed to be together in order to do their job so I wound up after 10 or 11 days I wound up combining all the groups of sheep together into one small group. And I had a little bit of electrified netting on hand because at that time I was using strand fencing, like three strands of poly wire uh -huh. uh, to, to subdivide fields. 
anyway, I put them in, I think I had four rolls. So I put all the sheep into these four rolls and they were like really packed in there dense. And I put all four dogs in there. And I just decided that the, some of the ewes were still lambing. And I just decided that I would rather have a few mismothered orphan lambs than have just feed them to the wolves. Well, those wolves hung around and I could not change my model there. They had to stay inside that small area and I wound up having to buy more net. And we wound up, I think of it as an inchworm, like setting up a net beside the, uh, a little paddock beside the one we were in. <laughs> and they'd move to that the next day because of course, when you put sheep in a small area like that, they're going to eat all that grass up overnight. Mm -hmm. So this is how I started moving every day. And the thing is with sheep, because like I said, we're spread out over, we have little pastures all over a two mile area. And actually later on, I was, I was to wind up, I had a lease down the road uh, that I was using at that time. But a few years later, I wound up leasing land about seven miles away so we were a very mobile sheep operation in the sense that we would get on the road and take long hikes to go from one paddock to the next. Anyway, one of the things I found out is that it's very hard to move baby lambs very yeah. far. Yep. So as a result, the paddock where we started at was getting to be six to eight weeks growth, regrowth back before we would get back to it. Keep in mind, we're moving every single day, kind of inchworming our way around the landscape. And then by the time the lambs were six weeks old, they are now old enough, we could take them all the way back to that starting point. Mm -hmm. This is where I kind of accidentally noticed that, gee, we weren't really seeing the muddy behinds that we used to see from parasites when we were doing that kind of three or four week rotation. So uh, and by the way, that wolf problem, that ended overnight. As soon as we put those sheep into that four rolls of net with four dogs, there was no more losses. That was the end of it right there. So not only did this mob, and basically what we're doing is mob stock grazing. So I always like to tell people I got into mob stock grazing through the back door because I've heard about it. I've gone on pasture walks where people did it. And I thought, oh, that's such poor nutrition because, you know, the grasses do get more mature before they come back. Mm -hmm. um, I was really skeptical about it, but I was forced into it. I, I didn't have a choice. I just had to start doing it. And so the next, and, and by the way, those wolves stuck around for an entire year and they died off the next spring during lambing, we think to Parvo, but they were ever present for an entire year. So I couldn't let my guard down for that entire season, but it worked pretty well. I was surprised we did not have any mothering problems with uh, what I now call lambing on the fly. It's where we have a drop bunch that are giving birth today. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, they're gonna move into a new paddock. The ones that are still pregnant move into a new paddock. And right behind them are the, the lambs that are under 24 hours old. And the next paddock over is going to be everything that's over 24 hours old. And these are three contiguous paddocks. So I have dogs in every paddock. And if we ever face a big pack of wolves like that, we're just going to stick the whole, whole mess together again in mm -hmm. one paddock. But keep in mind, a lot of our dogs will, are able to jump the net from one group to the next. So they're all you can picture three paddocks all contiguous and they kind of inchworm along until lambing is done and then they become one paddock or one big mob. So no longer am I leaving lambs behind, uh, you know, a half mile or a mile away from the main group. They're all always all together. But anyway, this is how we solved the predator problem. And a year later when the wolves finally did disappear, I didn't have any problems from it. I noticed that we didn't have parasites anymore. So I actually stuck with it from there on just because of the parasite. Uh, it solved my parasite problems as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had been looking for a solution not to be drenching sheep on 90 degree days in July. 
And this was it. And I got a little funny story to tell you is that uh, before this all happened, I had tried various things to try to reduce the burden on me physically. I tried hiring one time a 30 year old guy that uh, wanted to learn how to work around sheep. And, um, but he was kind of a city guy and he came out to help. It was good 85 degrees or so. I, you just can't get away from that in the middle of the summer. And uh, I had to keep stopping to give him a break. <laughs> I thought I was going to lose the guy to heat stroke or something. <laughs> so I had to keep stopping to get to cool, let him cool off. And, you know, anyway, it just didn't work. You know, it, it's like I obviously was conditioned to working outside in the heat and he wasn't. So it wasn't any advantage to hire a younger person to, to do the job. So anyway, yeah, this, this was remarkable on how it solved my parasite issues. I was a little hesitant to drop drenching altogether uh, through the summer. Um, so it took me five or six years before I actually put the drench gun down and stopped doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately I finally, I guess over the past 10 years, I have not been drenching in the summertime. Now there are the occasional exceptions, but the only time I do have to drench is because I broke the rule of letting sheep graze some grass that's less than six weeks regrowth. Mm -hmm. If I, for whatever reason, quick throw sheep into a paddock that's contaminated, chances are I'm going to have to drench those sheep. But that's only been uh, once or twice that I've had to do that in the past decade. Well, I just, I love this story, Janet, of, of how you, in um, observing what's going on and able to think through this, I, I love I love the approach of really thinking instead of following a recipe, you know, this is how you do it. High rise sheep that are in containment. And, you know, this is, this is a whole nother approach. And I think that as our world changes around us, the ability to adapt by good observation and testing things out is going to be really helpful. You know, a, another thing that I wonder about in relation to that is the breed of sheep that you raise and has that changed over time? And do you see any need to change it? Or do you have the sheep that are really well adapted to this system at this point in time? At this point in time, I, I have what I need, um, but it hasn't always been that way. I started out with Dorsets and anybody who's been in the business for a really long time knows that our breeds of sheep have changed a lot since the 70s. And I bought my first Dorsets from a guy who had his production flock and then he had his show sheep. And in the 80s, my very first years, I actually did show some sheep thinking I could have these. I was always production oriented, but I guess that's kind of what I grew up, you know, with the 4-H model and everything, you know, going through college. Um, so my first 10 years, I did do some showing and was very frustrated because the type of sheep that actually performed well on the farm weren't necessarily the ones that they were selecting for in the show ring. And finally, one of the judges who kind of knew me and knew I was a production oriented person said, you know, you got to make a decision. Either you're a production type sheep producer or you're a show ring type sheep producer. But he said, and this is, keep in mind, this is about mid eighties when he's telling me this, he says, you got to decide which way you're going to go because these are going to be two very different sheep. Mm -hmm. And that was like, it was really awesome advice to get at that point in time, because at that point I was thinking I could do both, but I was frustrated and he was absolutely right. So I made my choice. I was going to be a production oriented producer, but the thing is, is the rest of the world was still kind of basing all their selection on the show ring. And so the Dorset breed became very tall, very grain-based, um, meaning that they, they're, I call them high octane sheep. Mm -hmm. They need a lot of energy in the diet in order to become a finished lamb. And so on pasture, these are sheep that uh, just aren't finishing very well on grass. 
In 2000, I was able to acquire an Ile de France ram and that animal was just absolutely awesome. Uh, he put so much muscle and hardiness and just ability to grow on grass into my sheep. And so I pursued that breed. I, the way I like to tell it is the Ile de France is everything you always wanted a Dorset to be, but better. <laughs> I'm sure that's not going to please some Dorset breeders, but it that's really true. It's everything a Dorset is supposed to be, but it does it better. So I was able to, after that ram, I uh, brought some rams down from ca uh, Canada before they closed the border. Um, in fact, it was literally like a month before they closed the border. I was able to get those rams across and I've imported some Ile de France semen from Ireland. Anyway, since then, I've just been selecting for the characteristics that I want. We, we scan them for eye muscle depth. We measure growth on grass. And I was enrolled in lamb plan in Australia for many, many years and recently switched to NSIP. Uh, NSIP's data is processed by lamb plan. So it really wasn't like a change. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just that NSIP did decide to start using lamb plan. Yeah, so, and, and for our listeners, what Janet's talking about are expected breeding values, expected progeny differences. These are statistical ways to predict what the what the progeny will, uh, you know, what you could see out of the lambs by by looking at what their near relatives are doing. Is that a fair explanation, Janet? Right. For example, milk production in a ewe, you could either just look at her lambs and how they grew, which has a very low accuracy, or we can use a breeding value uh, produced through NSIP that is based on, say, 80 female relatives, which is far more accurate in selecting, and especially when you're trying to select a ram, for example, which you cannot measure milk production in a ram, but we can look at 80 plus, I mean, I'm just saying 80 because I started counting once how many female records went into one ram mm -hmm. and I stopped at 80. Okay. There's no ceiling at 80. It goes beyond that, but I'm just saying I stopped at 80 female relatives. That would be his sisters, his half sisters, his aunts, his grandmothers. And so the accuracy can go from say only 10% of making that decision to up to 90%. So we have a lot more accuracy when we use uh, estimated breeding values or uh, expected progeny difference when we're selecting for traits, especially difficult to measure in the male, such as uh, lambing percent or milk production, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big step forward in your program then when you started to use these statistical predictions of the quality of the sheep. And, um, you know, that's, that's an impressive story in and of itself. I wonder what other milestones or big jumps you made. It sounds like the idea of dealing with predators got you an answer to your parasite issues. Have there been any other kind of like, aha, this, this makes a difference in my ability to succeed? Well, part of that early grazing experience, you know, back in the 80s, I was feeding grain to the sheep. But by 91, I lambed my first group of sheep on pasture and saw big differences in abilities to mother up, count to three, meaning <laughs> as three can count three lambs. Differences in milk production were huge. Some ewes had lots of milk and some ewes didn't. And you know, when you creep feed lambs, you kind of cover that up you're disguising the milking ability of your ewes if the lambs can just go get their feed from a creep feeder. So I decided to do what I call pulling out the crutches, which disguise that sheep's ability to do its job. And so I stopped the creep feeding and I stopped, well, I just stopped a large number of practices that we do to be a good shepherd and do a good job because I wanted, I actually wanted some sheep to fail because I wanted to know who the weakest members of the flock were, so I could call them. Mm -hmm. um, and 
has gone a long ways to um, developing a flock that can produce a finished lamb on pasture. Don't have time to stay up to date on the freshest sustainable agriculture news, events, and funding opportunities? You can trust NCAT to keep you connected with our weekly harvest e-newsletter. Subscribe today at NCAT.org and get your weekly harvest delivered each Wednesday. Mm -hmm. You know, that makes me think about kind of what is your cycle through the year, Janet? When are you lambing and at what stage do you wean and and how does your marketing go? Sure. Well, I just did my pre-lambing preparation. Uh, we're in a cobalt deficient area. We're also deficient in selenium and iodine. However, I cannot get a bolus, a slow release bolus for all three here. You can buy that anywhere else in the world, but not here. But I just gave them their cobalt boluses because we are deficient in cobalt. And it seems to be a mineral that's not in the pre-bagged minerals for sheep mm -hmm. in adequate amounts for our area. So I gave them a slow release cobalt bolus. We are in the liver fluke area, even though we don't have to deworm for the usual types of parasites in sheep. Our deer spread liver fluke, so we always have a fall and then a spring of defluking is what I would say. That's a, The liver fluke is a parasite that can be almost as big as your thumb that migrates through the liver of a sheep and will kill it. Mm. So I drenched them for flukes, and that's it. that's it. We're done with the flukes until next fall. And I vaccinated them with an eight-way vaccine. Then we're going to lamb late May. And I've moved it back a little bit because it seems like we're having colder, longer, like spring is taking longer to get here in recent years. So I've actually moved it back. It used to be May 10th and now we're shooting for May 18th as a starting date. And we'll, we'll lamb on pasture in that system that I, I called lambing on the fly where that we move the pregnant ewes forward into a fresh paddock every day. And we leave behind the ones that just lamb just to mother up for a day before they move. So we'll lamb in late May. We spend the summer moving every single day, trying to keep good grass under their feet. And lambs will go to market at the end of the grazing season. Now it's long past the growing season, but, but because of the nature of what we do, we'll have a nice stockpile for November and December. And we'll finish the lambs on that stockpile. Now, something I used to do when the flock was larger, and I have downsized recently, I, I had back surgery, so I, I had to cut things back a bit. But back when I was renting land, I also grew turnips for finishing lambs. And that was absolutely a wonderful crop. You could get about 10 lambs to the acre for finishing tur for turnips. Uh, the feed quality of turnips is like the relative feed value is about 283%. That's oh my. Almost, yeah, it's almost like feeding alfalfa hay and corn. Um, wow. So it's, a, and it's easy to grow. And the best part of it is it takes the summer sunlight and stores the energy of that summer sunlight in the bulb and it doesn't freeze in the winter. <laughs> the bulbs get softer and the lambs actually prefer them after they've frozen a few times. So, we would graze the tops in the early fall. And then as things start getting colder and the, we start getting freezing weather, they start eating the bulbs. So we'll come back the last time and feed the bulb, uh, graze the bulbs. Mm -hmm. So I used to do that and I absolutely love turnips. However, it did require some tillable land to do that. And I, when I was doing that, I had an arrangement with the people that I leased from, they had the equipment and they had a rotation going where they maybe had alfalfa fields they needed to turn under. And their normal thing would be to plant some corn because alfalfa will be toxic to itself if you continuously grow alfalfa in the same place. So they would usually do a couple of years of corn before putting it back into alfalfa again. Well, I just asked my landlords, hey, could we just do a couple of years of turnips? And it's perfect because you don't want to do turnips in one place for more than two years. There's some sort of rot that starts to affect the turnips if you do it more than two years in a row. So it worked perfect. I 
you know, paid them to uh, plow up the, this field that they were going to plow up anyway and plant my turnips for me. And then I'd, I'd use it for two years and then they'd put it back into their alfalfa and we'd go to their next field that they needed to turn up. So there was like sort of a, I don't know, seven year rotation we had going mm -hmm. for these alfalfa fields. But anyway, that worked great. However, when I had back surgery, that was in 2017, I needed to uh, downsize to what fit on my farm. I just wasn't able to walk that far. So we're strictly finishing on grass and the, the finishing grass in the fall has to be a stockpiled, just native plants as mm -hmm. well as grazing. Mm -hmm. And then I know that the quality of the meat that you produce is incredibly important to you. You've done quite a little bit of writing on the health values and nutrient density of lamb raised in different ways and lamb versus other other proteins. Can you talk with us about that a little bit, please? Well, any pastured animal is going to have roughly five times more conjugated linoleic acid, which has been found to be useful for many different health issues in people. It, uh, a diet with a good amount of conjugated linoleic acid will mean more lean muscle mass, less obesity, it helps reduce certain types of cancer. It's helpful for diabetics. And boy, there's, there's the fifth thing there and I'm not remembering it right now, but it, it's, a, it's a very healthy for us to eat meat or milk high in conjugated linoleic acid. Also the omega-3 content of the uh, fat in grazing animals is much higher in our lamb and beef and milk of grazing animals. And omega-3s are anti-inflammatory and help the cardiovascular system. So some have speculated that, you know, our diet used to be grass-fed meats, that we would harvest our meats in the fall and uh, store them. And, you know, I grew up in a house that was over 300 years old we had meat hooks in the basement hmm. um, and we had a smoker built into the house, believe it or not. It's an old stone house. It was a really interesting house. And we had a spring house with meat hooks in it. Wow. So, you know, and it used to be we'd harvest this meat in the fall when it was high in these omega-3s and conjugated linoleic acid. And that's the type of food that we used to eat. Well, now it's all grain fed or fed stored feeds and the omega-3 content of lamb, for example, or beef starts declining after four weeks after the animal leaves pasture and, and it takes a nosedive at six weeks after the animal has left pasture. So, you know, it's, it's important for them to be grazing fresh green plants in order to have a high omega-3 and conjugated linoleic acid. And there's actually other fatty acids there that are beneficial as well. I just wasn't quite prepared to talk about all of them, but, but anyway, yeah. So these have health benefits to us. And the interesting thing is, is lamb really shines above them all. I mean, you'll hear some debate about beef. Is there enough increase in omega-3s in grass-fed beef to be worth the difference in price? And beef is very, very lean and does not have nearly the omega-3 content that lamb does. Lamb immediately has at least five times more than beef. Um, now lamb is, like our lamb is 20% fat when we've done our, we did some testing at Iowa State um, and tested the omega-3 and uh, conjugated linoleic acid and a number of other fatty acids. I think there were 10 in all. But the interesting thing is, is our lamb is actually so high in omega-3s that it's comparable to farmed salmon. It's not the same as wild salmon, but it's comparable to, to farmed salmon mm -hmm. for omega-3 content. So lamb has been called land salmon. And I think that's pretty appropriate. <laughs> of all the land animals, this is your best source of omega-3s. You know, and that uh, goes back to something that that I read 
decades ago as I was learning more about sheep, and that's that many of the longest lived people <laughs> through time have been shepherds, uh, people who have their primary source of protein being sheep rather than other other types of protein. And at the time I thought, well, this is probably like, you know, the sheep industry saying this, but since then we're learning more and more about how the different uh, diversity of diets can affect the nutritive values of the feed that we have. A lot of the work that Fred Pervenza has done and that I've seen just managing my own sheep and, you know, spent years and years with cattle too. And it seems to me like sheep are, uh, they have these narrow little muzzles to start with. Even, even if you're in a planted pasture that maybe is only going to have a few species in it, those sheep are, they're selecting for diversity. They're selecting for richness in their diet. It is amazing how adapted they are to to being able to thrive in any different environment. You know, when you talked about the cobalt deficiency, it sounds like you've really honed in on what it takes for your sheep to survive and thrive in your particular um, landscape and that you need cobalt to add to that. So I wonder about mineral supplementation in general, Janet, is how do you approach that um, and how could a beginning shepherd start to think about what mineral balancing they might need to do for their flock? Well, there's a few things you can do there. I did work with for a long time with Bill Keogh, that's K-E-O-U-G-H. He does mineral balancing where you send him your forage samples and you can test for up to 16 different micronutrients and he'll make a base or micro mix that you add to your own salt and calcium um, or dical, depending upon what you need and uh, mix it in. And my flock did very well on that program for years. And what got started on that was, this is probably in the early nineties, we ran into some copper poisoning problems with a popular brand of mineral. Now, a lot of people wound up with copper poisoning that year. I think that particular brand uh, made a mixing error mm. and a whole bunch of us had some copper problems. But that's what sent me over to Bill to solve the, the copper issue. We did find out inadvertently that our pastures are actually pretty high in copper here. There's actually the ancient indigenous people from this area mined copper on the riverbanks nearby. Uh -huh. So this is, this is a high copper area. And we tested our forages and found out that our grass was 18 parts per million. 11 is what's considered safe. Oh my. So I approached Bill Keogh with this dilemma. And like I said, it turns out a lot of people had copper poisoning on that particular brand that year. So I think they had a, a mixing error. But still, I, you know, that I certainly wasn't going to feed it. And uh, I went to Bill with that problem and he said, we can raise the molybdenum and the sulfur and the calcium, and that would help reduce the absorption of copper from our pasture. And it worked. It, it worked marvelously. We never saw another problem with that again. But when, back to when I had back surgery, so fast forward, you know, 15 years or so, I had back surgery and the problem with that premix is it required lifting 50 pound bags into a cement mixer and it, it required a lot of lifting and it was easier to go back to the farm store and just buy a pre-made sheep mineral. Mm -hmm. And I noticed my sheep, there's a particular look with cobalt deficiency. It resembles parasites. Mm -hmm. They're unthrifty and you get kind of a dark scours. And I started seeing these things in my sheep. And I knew that just looking at pictures, hey, they looked a lot better when I was on Bill's mineral program. But at this point, I'm not able to, to be lifting these bags and see, I, I could go to the farm store, have them put the bags in the back of my truck, come home and then have a, a hired kid unload this stuff for me while I'm healing up from this surgery. So, you know, having them mix my stuff was 
too much to ask. <laughs> I guess, it, you know, I'm usually hiring uh, high school kids. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I did a lot of reading, I guess. And some also an experience I had when I was working at Pine Tech as a lamb and wool instructor, there was a farm. I noticed there was this poverty belt around Mille Lacs Lake. I call it a poverty belt because all the livestock looked really poor there. And we, through a lot of research, found out that cobalt was deficient. Now, part of that is that's an area high in peat soils. Right. We so the are, pH. Yeah. There's a lot of peat in Minnesota. Our farm has a lot of peat. And it just got me thinking, you know, looking up various deficiencies and whatnot. And it occurred to me that we probably have a cobalt deficiency and Bill's mineral, his premix solved it for us. And we didn't even know that, you know, that was a solution there. So anyway, for right now, the easiest solution is to give them these long or slow release cobalt boluses. Um, we give it to the ewes twice a year and we give it to the lambs at weaning. And that seems to solve the, the problem for us. I wish, I wish, I wish that they would make a bolus with cobalt, selenium, and iodine, because those are the three minerals we're very lacking here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I want to circle back to um, infrastructure a little bit, because it seems like through your program, you got past the need to have the barns so that you could jug lamb, and, and you put a lot of a lot of uh, resources into your electronet. And, and it sounds like as you're moving these sheep quite a bit, at least one of the challenges we would have out West here is how do you keep them watered when you do that? So what can you tell us about the infrastructure that it would take to implement the type of grazing that you're doing, Janet? Okay, well, I'll tell you, we're really portable. I could pack up and move my flock anywhere in about three hours. <laughs> Because that's what I've been doing. I've, I've depended a lot on rented land for many years here, for actually probably almost 30 years of leasing land from other people. And typically that land had nothing on it. It was just empty fields with no fencing or anything. For water, I did try piping the water all over the place. I, at one point, had a mile and a half of black water pipe all over but what was then sold as burst proof pipe turned out not to be so burst proof. Um, yeah. It, it, after repairing, I don't know, 18 leaks and 600 feet after what we did do was try to blow it out or gravity, let it drain with gravity or whatever. But we got caught with an early frost one year and there was no opportunity to drain it. And it just bust the pipe all over the farm I mean, I thought I was pretty clever when I figured out how to get under the highway and under the railroad tracks <laughs> with this pipe. But anyway, then I talked to the local dairy farmers who were using it and said, oh, yeah, we have to replace it every three years. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that wasn't very viable for me. So I have a, a little ATV trailer that I put, a, a you know, for the flock that I have it. <laughs> 125 gallon water tank. I also had a 350 gallon tank that went in the back of uh, a pickup truck because I did for 17 years, I had beef cattle as well. And um, the cattle drink quite a lot more water per pound body weight than sheep do. So I had the bigger tank for the cattle, um, but I haul the water and I use those uh, Rubbermaid 50 gallon water troughs mm -hmm. and just line them up along the fence and haul the water. and you know, you got to go, I guess I would say it took, uh, depends on whether I had to make extra trips during a really hot summer day, but it was about, I would say 30 minutes a trip to water the sheep, but this way it was totally portable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like some of your infrastructure are your dogs. You know, I know you use a border collie at times and, and the guard dogs seem like they made a difference. And I know it's weird to called dogs infrastructure but but what about dogs what about dogs definitely must have border collies i mean we're we were moving sheep up and down roads all the time when we were renting land so uh the only way to do that and keep control of those animals is with a good border collie and it's 
a good border collie is worth its weight in gold. They, they can do anything for you. In fact, when you use the word infrastructure, they can greatly reduce the infrastructure you need because we can walk the sheep freely anywhere. And that seven mile hike to uh, one of the farms that I rented, I mean, we would, <laughs> we'd call the railroad up and make sure there were no trains. Usually there weren't any trains on Sunday. We'd walk up the railroad tracks to get under the interstate highway and to get to the other side of a town nearby. And then we'd take the back roads to get to that farm. No way could we do that without a border collie. They kept total control. I just, uh, like I said, I just dewormed and vaccinated sheep. The dog kept the shoots full the whole time. In fact, I never had to talk to the dog. The dog just kept the shoots full. Um, so border collie is absolutely essential. And I would recommend if you haven't trained one yourself before, it's worth paying the money to buy a trained dog to start with and, you know, get to some clinics and learn how to, to work with the dog. And then the livestock guard dogs are essential here. We have a wide variety of predators. You know, we bought this farm, we're wedged between an interstate highway and a state highway. And we thought there would be no predator problems here because of the highways. And boy, were we wrong. Just last uh, couple weeks ago, we had to chase a bear off our deck. And, you know, we've got black bears, we've got uh, lots of coyotes. And we always, in the past 15 years, there's probably been a wolf here every year or more um, up to, besides that pack of 23, we have seen eight to 10. It's not very often that we get a whole pack here, but when we do, it's, it's around eight or 10. We've had fishers. I had a fisher kill a lamb once. We oh, really? 100 pound lamb. Yeah, it uh, attacked its head and uh, messed up a couple of dogs really bad too. It, it attacked their faces. Wow. Um, and it actually somehow ate into the head of the lamb and killed it. Mm. Um, but that was, and in that particular case, the dog that was in charge of those sheep or those lambs is only six months old. And based on the dog hair that was scattered about, I think he tried <laughs> to, to do something, but they're a pretty nasty animal. And like I said, that he came back and he messed up a couple of older dogs on me, um, just bit their faces up so bad. Um, but yes, we rely on the livestock guard dogs tremendously. That, that same bear that was on the deck, the only reason he was there was because we don't have any dogs in the yard. They're all behind fences out in the pasture. Um, but you know, that bear is case to keep out and last summer we, he attempted several times to get in with the rams. We always have a fair sized group of rams cause we sell breeding rams and, uh, the dog in charge there chased that bear out several times. Um, so we definitely need the dogs to keep the sheep safe. That, that tells you about the power of the dogs that the bear would rather face the humans than your guard dogs. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. yeah, yeah he's, he's probably he's probably wishing that you had a llama instead. <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, Janet. So many of the people who listen to this series are are people who are just thinking about getting started with sheep or thinking about ramping up from you know, just their few experimental sheep. Many of the people that listen to the series are women thinking about doing this. And do you have any particular advice for people who are just thinking about this transition into more sheep? Well, sheep are perfect because I, I mean, part of what got me into them is I didn't need to rely on anybody's help. I was already raising sheep before I met my husband. You know, it's it's a smaller animal, so you don't have to recruit anybody else to help you out with them. The fencing, everything, it's it's easy to do. You know, the rolls and netting are 15 <laughs> pounds each. It it doesn't require, boy, you know what the infrastructure. I've got the sheep, I've got rolls and netting, I've got some rubber made tubs, and I've got an ATV with a trailer mm -hmm. and dogs, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And it's all very portable. And it's also very expandable. Like I said, when my, my observation, when I was working at Pine Tech, 
is that the barns were limiting a lot of people to the flock size because their bottleneck was lambing time, you know, just sort of the culture, sheep culture of the Midwest is that you should lamb in January and therefore you can only have as many sheep as you can hold in your barn in January. <laughs> and that was really limiting flock sizes for a lot of people. When you start lambing on pasture, there's no limit really. And of course, this will vary depending upon where you live. But for us here in Minnesota, in this more marginal farm ground, it's unlimited the number of forage resources available to us. I mean, it's it's have fun. The way I look at it is have fence will travel. You know? <laughs> it, it's there's so much land around here that is underutilized. Uh, another area I have not done, but I think is just waiting for potential is just looking around these towns around here. There's been housing developments that have gone through their booms and their busts. And often there's land sitting there that somebody has bought to speculate and you'll see the lots divided out and they're, they've got their for sale signs there, but they're not necessarily getting built up they may sit there for 10 or more years vacant. And then pretty soon the fire department is talking to those people about that fire hazard that they have with all that tall grass. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this about Minnesota, but we're every bit as big a forest fire area. In fact, the location I live on was burned. The topsoil was burned off in the late 1800s to one of the largest ever forest fires in the country. So fire is a big problem here and these housing, you know, where they buy up a farm and, and they subdivide it and then it doesn't sell for a long time. I think there's a business opportunity of grazing those lots mm -hmm. um, where you could be paid to graze those lots to keep the vegetation under control. Because I do know that our fire department has contacted some of these developments and told them you need to do something about that grass um, because it's a fire hazard. Yeah, and I think a similar opportunity in some places, I don't know if this is so in Minnesota, but the agri-solar, so grazing sheep in solar arrays, you know, here in the West with the wildfire problems that we have using them for for creating fire breaks or for revegetating, you know, I've just never seen anything like sheep for taking a bunch of weeds that are over your head and, and with managed grazing in a couple of years, getting it back into, into grass cover, something that uh, is less flammable, easier to manage. And, you know, people just like the look of it better than, than four foot tall pigweed and lamb's quarter, which is fantastic feed for sheep. Yeah. Um, Yep. Yeah. Um, solar grazing under the solar panels is perfect. I mean, the sheep are a small animal, so they fit right under there just perfectly. In fact, there is an organization of sheep solar grazers out there. They have a, I know they have an email group. I, that would be something for you to contact is to talk to mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Um, but there is a, a whole organization of of sheep producers who graze specifically graze under solar panels. Some other possibilities are under high wires or you know electrical mm -hmm. um, wires, and also the um, ponds you know for city sewage. Oh yeah, um, you know those are often fenced off and mowed. Anywhere you see a uh, vegetation that needs to be controlled, that is actually a, a business opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so when a lot of people say, well, I only have five acres or 10 acres or whatever, it's like, don't ever limit yourself to what you actually are sitting on because there's probably plenty of grazing opportunities anywhere around the neighborhood. And like I said, it's, it's unlimited here. It's just a matter of moving fence and like I said, with the infrastructure that I have, the fence, the water tubs, the dogs, and the sheep, that's, that's all very easy to move anywhere. Oh, that's so encouraging. As, as we get towards the end of this conversation, Janet, you know, you've, you have kind of created a, oh, I don't know what the word is. You're just very inspiring to those of us who are interested in production 
uh, agriculture using sheep. And, and I know you're always learning and, and growing. And I wonder what constitutes success for you and what lies ahead? Well, success ultimately is you, you do need to make some money at this, you know, so that's, it's, it's very important to keep your costs under control. And that's how I got to where I am at with the pasture-based type sheep operation was, it was just a way to control costs. So you do need to make money at it, but it needs to be fun. Can't say that enough. If you are miserable, you need to change something. It's important that you enjoy what you're doing. It's a lot of hard work and it has to be fun. Otherwise, you need to do something else. Looking forward, I mean, I've been through a few surgeries here. I had back surgery and a couple ankle surgeries. So I'm kind of scaled back a bit. And I'm personally looking at more just educating, helping people with how to do, do these things. So I did start a TikTok channel, um, which is, it's at Tamarack underscore sheep. And it's just educational videos. Just they're three minutes long just educational videos on how to do stuff with sheep. Um, a lot of grazing information there and a lot of livestock guard dog information in there. Wow, that's wonderful. What a great resource. And then you write quite a little bit for Gray's Magazine too. Is that a regular column, Janet, where people could find you? Yes, I've been writing for them for probably uh, 17 or 18 years, I think. So also they would have also have a lot of back issues. The thing would be to pick a topic and find out what issue it's in, I guess. But yeah, I write almost every month for them. A little less lately, because after writing for 18 years, it's a little hard to come up with some new things. <laughs> um, well, I keep, but, I keep hoping that someday you're going to do a book, Janet. Uh, I, know that, I know that you're so busy doing it. You, you can either be doing it or writing about it. But I am so excited to hear about this TikTok channel. I'm old and I have not uh, adopted TikTok, um, but I'm going to now. I'm going to go have a look at at Tamarack underscore sheep so I can see some of these videos I just, I can't thank you enough, Janet, for taking time to talk with us today. And I wonder if you just have any parting thoughts for the folks who are listening. Just like I was say, just saying a minute ago, make sure you're having fun. <laughs> you got to, got to enjoy this. So if you're not, you got to stop and look at what's, what's making you miserable and change it. That's all. <laughs> but I, I think, um, you know, the land prices that we've seen in this past year are just incredible. Uh, I think the sheep have a tremendous future coming up. Prices I never even dreamed of, to, to be honest. And the, the mistake that I see a lot of people making and getting into sheep is they build their structure around that price. And they're giving up so much profit potential because the, they, you know, they're building elaborate barns and putting all the money into the barn instead of, you know, just building a good pasture-based sheep operation and being able to put some of that in their pocket. So, you know, I think there's some exciting opportunities coming up here, with, especially with the prices where they're at. And I realize we're all sitting here at the cusp of increasing feed prices and, you know, just increasing costs all the way around the board. But you know, a pasture-based sheep operation is somewhat insulated from that, not entirely because high fertilizers, high fertilizer prices are still going to affect our hay prices. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for, from May to December, I am totally unaffected by these feed costs that are rising um, because we simply are eating grass. So, yeah. and, and yet we've seen, um, depends upon where you live in the country, but definitely $3 lambs here. And, you know, if you go East, there's $5 lambs. You can't beat that. Yeah. Well, and especially, you know, just I'm looking at my notes here on the table, making sure that I've got all the questions asked and I was making more notes while we talked. And I feel like going back to those three P's that we all face, it seems like you have one P that solves the other three. And that's, you know, if, if you want to have good outcomes with profit, 
and handle the problems of predators and parasites, big part of the answer is pasture and knowing how to knowing how to use your sheep and handle the the resource that is there which is pasture so i can't thank you enough janet for taking the time to talk with us and i will be watching your TikTok channel and wishing you all the best all right well thank you very much that's it for this episode thanks for listening additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Rich Myers. ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana. It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.